Hello, good morning. It's a pleasure to introduce South Wales Potash this morning to you. If you can move to slide three, please. South Hars Potash is a company with assets of significant scale uh, in central Germany. 5.3 billion tonnes of mineral resources is, is huge. We cover an area of 659 square kilometres. And we have three perpetual mining licences, which are quite unique. They have no time restraints or royalty requirements. And we have two regular exploration licences. Um, the approach we intend to take to exploit our properties is fairly simple and fairly straightforward. It's not complicated at all and we're supplying into a growing market and in Europe there is a deficit of supply over demand which we can exploit. Germany itself is a highly attractive location and I'll talk to that through the presentation. Moving on to slide four please. This is a map of the South Hearts region where we operate. The dark green dotted line represents the potash basin and you can see the land holding we have highlighted here in the various colours is, is fairly dominant in the area. Uh, the Grey areas to the north um, are the old mined out areas that were mined during the East German um, period over, over some 100 years. In the very top right hand corner you can see the Omgeburger area and sorry top left hand corner uh, that is the siting of our first project. You can see it's the smallest of our properties but in some ways the most prospective and easiest to develop. Um, Moving on, please, to slide number seven. The markets themselves are uh, in a very interesting position. The underlying um, thesis has always been that uh, potash demand will increase as the world's population increases, as the world's diet improves, and as finite arable land becomes exhausted, requiring uh, additional yield from crops. That's all still true, but of course it's been dramatically affected by the geopolitics of the last few months with conflict in Europe and purchasers of the commodity are uh, looking at the strategic nature of potash uh, in the food security debate and that's I think causing a structural shift in the price upwards that's not going to reverse in the short term. So you can see historically the price has sort of hovered around the two to three hundred dollar level. I think that that history if you like is going to be reset going forwards to our advantage. Moving on to the next slide please. The Ongerberger project is the first of our projects. Uh, it is a down dip of the old mines, as I mentioned earlier. It is also on the Silver Knight horizon, which is the preferred ore. And uh, it is the first taxi out the ranks, so to speak, in terms of exploiting the large land position we have in the area. The highlights of the Ongerberger project are, of course, that uh, it has a low carbon footprint. It, it'll be an underground mine with very little on surface. Um, and we can come to the environmental credentials in a later slide. Um, it's in an area with a strong potash mining history, which is important to us. And these rights are perpetual with no royalties thereon. So that makes them financially very attractive as well. It's a shallow deposit, thick, simple, well understood mineralogy, been mined for many years. Moving on, please, to the next slide. We've numbered the different projects here on that map, and um, the Ongerberger project is the first taxi out the rank, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we have some 300 boreholes across those properties that we inherited with the, uh, the mineral rights when we acquired them. And uh, you can see the Ongerberger property in the bottom left hand corner is actually the smallest of the properties, and you can see the size of the others by comparison. So we're starting out with the smallest and most prospective. But it's by no means the, uh, the the cream of the crop. There is more to come in the future. Moving on, please. When we acquired the mineral rights, uh, we inherited some 300 borehole results with the properties. And to put that in context, each one of these holes costs about two and a half to three million euros to replace. So it's a fairly um, uh, important inheritance. In in terms of financial value. We did not, however, have the core from those boreholes and to get a competent person to upgrade the inferred resource to indicate it, we needed to do some parallel drilling, some confirmatory drilling. We've done that during the first part of this year and some 89% of the Silvernite seam at Ongerberger 
has been upgraded to indicate that as a result of drilling there's two holes. So you can see that the lever leverage, if you like, from um, uh, being able to do small amounts of drilling to extrapolate those results to the other holes, it gives us a significant uplift in, in, uh, in geological data for very little investment effectively. And um, that, I think, was a uh, good value for money. Moving on, please. So the Onkaburga project itself um, and the physical outcomes from it are that we are planning in our scoping study to mine a million tonnes per month of potash. Uh, that comes from four hoisted ore and also gives us two million tonnes of salt, uh, one million tonnes of which is saleable. It gives us a 21 year mine life with a 3.6 year payback. And um, down the right hand side of the page, you can see some of the salient uh, physical attributes of the property. About 60% of the product will be granular, 40% will be uh, standard grade MOP as they call it. And we'll probably sell about 75% in, into the European market with 25% going to exports during the off season. Moving on, please. So as we evaluate this, this, uh, this first project, um, we have completed the initial scoping study work high standard. It's based on what we believe are realistic and sensible assumptions. Um, and it shows a fairly compelling financial outcome, which I'll come to on a latter slide. Um, the funding of the project uh, is something that obviously now and this study gives us the first hard data to enable us to go and discuss with uh, various strategic investors and with potential funding partners how the fun how the project might be funded going forward. Um, included in that, of course, is the possibility of aim listing at some point in the future, uh, royalty streams and um, offtake contracts, and all those things are fully available to the company to finance the project going forward. So we have a complete um, array of options in terms of how the fun how the project is funded in the long term. As we the development itself, it's all pretty straightforward. We believe we can fast track the development and complete it in two years post permitting, again, which I'll come back to. Moving on, please. Financial results of the uh, scoping study were fairly robust uh, at a potash price of $385 per tonne, which compares to the current spot price of around $850 a tonne. And we're coming out with a net present value of around just less than $1.3 billion. Um, and an IRR of 26%. So, so a fairly sort of compelling set of financial outcomes. The cash operating cost of the project comes out net of byproduct credits at around $93 a tonne, and that's fairly near the bottom end of the cost curve. The cost of the build project, project build is $620 million, which is not insubstantial, but by potash standards, it's actually extremely competitive. We did run the net present value, obviously, at a, at a range of other numbers. Uh, and the net present value at the spot price at the time the scoping study was released of $900 per tonne came out of $4.2 so, you know, pretty high numbers. There is an alternative case that we are evaluating where we actually uh, build the mine in two 500 million tonne slugs rather than a, a going, you know, for the 1 million tonne in one go, and that comes out with a peak financing of $443 million. So there is a way to moderate the capital requirement if necessary. Moving on, please. Being based in Germany, of course, the environmental focus is, is paramount and uh, the obligations that we are going to have to comply with are extremely strict. There are two uh, undertakings we've given, uh, which are really important to understand. One is that we will develop this mine with no permanent waste piles on surface. And the second obligation we have is that there will be no industrial water discharges uh, into groundwater and into rivers, etc. Uh, we are able to give those promises because of the mining and processing approach we have selected. Mining will be through room and pillar uh, approach uh, and on takeout pillars and, and substitute that with backfill. And that will mean that all the waste we produce on service can go back underground. In terms of water discharges, the processing approach we've taken there uh, does not produce uh, large volumes of brine. Um, it, it enables us to um, it's a leaching process followed by a crystallization process, which is not water-based specifically. And therefore, the, any brine that is produced can go back underground with the waste stockpiles. So there'll be no uh, tailings on surface and all that sort of thing. So those two undertakings are extremely important in terms of permitting. 
and he specifically designed the uh, uh, approach to these exploiting these assets on the basis that we can meet those two obligations. Moving on, please, to the next slide. Uh, as you will expect, the social commitments in any area of paramount importance, but they're particularly important to us in the South Arts area of Germany. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, mining has taken place in this region for some 100 years, and the mines that were there on reunification in Germany um, were largely uh, underinvested and overmanned and, and not economic at that time and were closed by the, uh, by the combined new German government. That created uh, some resentment and some pushback by the local inhabitants uh, in the South Hearts region. And indeed, there were strikes and there were hunger strikes and protests uh, and such like at the time. And the local population felt very strongly that the mines themselves uh, did have a future and should be invested in, and that there was plenty of potash to be mined. Uh, but at the time, that the East German, the new German government, the combined from West, decided not to go down that route. So, so there was a lot of uh, resentment, if you like, at the time from the local population to, as regards the decisions that were taken. So as we, as we look to revitalize mining in the area, we need to be conscious of that history. And we found that there is generally a fertile ground for conversations around reactivating mining because it, it gives the, the locals a chance to say, we told you so, look, there's now a foreign company that can do what we told you could be done all those years ago. So that there is a, a good uh, level of support for, for mining in the area generally. And there are lots of people that have mining in the history of their families in the area. Moving on, please. So the all important delivery pathway, uh, this is basically the next five years and the work we have cut out in front of us. Uh, the first step is to finalize the site selection and to complete the pre-fee study, which will take us around 18 months. In parallel with that, we'll complete the environmental study that's required to inform the full feasibility study, which is detailed on the next line, which will take us two and a half years to complete. Those work streams have been designed and dovetailed to the permitting process, which we can commence in six months time and takes in total about two and a half years. It's done in stages. The first stage is to approve the site. And the second stage is to improve the mine operating plan. And effectively at the end of that two and a half year period, you get your permission to go ahead and build the mine, which uh, gives us the last line on the chart, which means we can start uh, building around the back end of financial year 2025 and it's a two-year build process so it's a fairly uh, straightforward uh, program of work and we're already enthusiastically engaged upon that next slide please so last but not least we just want to draw attention to uh, the, the series of taxes that may come out the rank over future years this is obviously a, a long-term prognosis the Omgeberger project itself um, ha has already been initiated it's got an 18-month PFS process which has been approved by the board we will explore synergies with our neighbours in the region, which may improve the prospects of the study itself. And we're in the process of building our team so that we have the capacity to deliver. But thereafter, there are future projects uh, which, over a passage of time and leveraging the 300 boreholes of data we already have, uh, can be a key differentiating factor in showing us as a, as a company that has, has several projects and we're not a one-trick pony. And we can develop those assets into a, the growing market as the deficit of supply and demand in Europe uh, increases going forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Um, bang on time, and thank you for your time. Now, a couple of questions here. Um, new rate of potash, MOP, which is what you're producing, um, does, does it compete with sulphide of potash? And obviously, sulphide of potash has, uh, doesn't contain chloride or, or salt. So how, how do you see them sitting together in, in what's a, obviously a very big market given BHP has entered into this market in a major way as well? Uh, SOP uh, is a very small market compared to MOP. The, in, in rough numbers, the MOP market is about 70 million tonnes globally, whereas SOP is only seven. So MOP is a large, global, deep marketplace that's globally traded. So it's a much better place to be from a marketing point of view. Uh, MOP is simpler to produce. It doesn't have the technical complications that SOP has. The, both the extraction and the processing there are always all tried and tested and doesn't have any uh, complications in terms of pro process type. Uh, and MOP is used primarily on things like wheat, uh, corn, um, uh, soya beans, the sort of major large cereal crops, which is why it's such a big and deep market. Whereas uh, SOP is used more in sort of the niche products like certain exotic fruits tobacco, that kind of thing. So MOP is definitely the place to be because it's simpler, it's a bigger market, it's global, 
uh, and, and indeed it's it's more widely used. And, and given the geopolitical risks which have supported the MOP price, but obviously in, in somewhere like Germany, the power prices are through the roof. You've got droughts impacting uh, water supply and, and uh, power generations as well. Have you kind of modelled the, the rising energy costs in, into your scenario? Yes, that was quite a difficult uh, decision to take. The scoping study as released um, obviously contains energy prices in there. Uh, the prices we used were driven by long-term uh, uh, futures uh, energy prices in Europe as quoted at the time, so they were, they were sensible. Um, there were some 30% above historical averages, uh, but of course the issue in, in Europe right now is at crisis levels, and predicting what prices will be five years out is extremely difficult. Um, so we have allowed funds in the PFS stage of our study to do a complete review of uh, sources of energy uh, obviously, the environmental uh, as impact of, of energy choices is something we want to look at very closely as well. So we've taken a sensible approach to the number we used in the long term model. Um, but clearly, it, it is one of the factors that is a bit up in the air right now, quite frankly. And um, I, I think it's going to take a, a few years before that issue settles down. And you can make better informed decisions than we can at the moment. And, and just finally and quickly, um, in regards to CapEx, what, what sort of numbers are we talking and, and what, what does a strategic partner look like or an offtake partner? The capital for the first of our projects is uh, estimated to be $620 million. That includes $95 million of contingency. These are US dollars. Um, and um, uh, that by comparison to sort of industrial norms is about 60% or so of what you would expect on a global average potash project. And the reason it's uh, comparatively low is that we don't require any infrastructure really for this project because we have road, rail, water and power, as you've already mentioned, uh, on our doorstep already because this is a, an area that historically has produced for many years. So it's capital wise extremely efficient versus industry averages, but nevertheless it's quite a chunky number for a small company like ours. Um, as regards strategic investors, um, we have an open shareholder register. We have no commitments in terms of any offtake royalties or, or any other such instruments. So we have the full array of possible financing options ahead of us. And as I mentioned earlier, now that we have some hard data from the scoping study, we can explore those options and we'll do that over the next two and a half year period. Uh, ideally for us, a strategic partner would be a, a financially interested party that's prepared to come in at the ground floor while our share price is very low. And of course, as we add some granularity and detail to our project study, and we take it from scoping study through to PFS to DFS, etc., there's a lot of uh, um, um, the prospects of, of increases in share more significant. So finding a, 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 a financial partner, if you like, that's prepared to join us on that journey and to take to fund its corner, if you like, for the fund place over the sort of 18 months, two and a half years, will be very important. Never and thanks for your time. Um, just got a couple of internet issues at the end, but thank you for your time. Uh, we'll follow the story with interest. Have a nice weekend. Thank you very much.